don't we, that subject matter of sacrifice and surrender had to be a part of the prayers Jesus prayed that stretched all night long on the mountainside. I mean, after all, you don't sit in prayer all night long and not talk to God about your fears, your concerns, your inner inhibitions, the admissions of deep trust. I repeat it again, Jesus was on the mountain praying all night. And when you read what he immediately does after he returns from prayer in the morning, we know what else must have been a part of that prayer time. Yes, he was praying about his surrender to the mission of human redemption. He was praying about his sacrifice of his will in pursuit of the greater will of his father. But he was also praying about his selection of those who would become his disciples. And in this, Jesus could not make a mistake. The prophets had foretold of things that must happen. The law required a certain progression of human events. Things had to happen in certain contexts and in synchronicity with portions of the early Hebrews communal life and their religious practices. After a whole night in prayer up on the mountainside talking with God, listening to God, exchanging intimately in God's presence, Jesus descends the morning after, and Luke says he makes his selection of the 12 men who he says he would designate as apostles. And among that selection, after a whole night on the mountainside in prayer, visioning the path towards human redemption, Verse 16 says, one is selected whose name is Judas Iscariot, who becomes a traitor. I don't know why this past week I read this asking of the text a different question than I've asked of that same text before during previous readings. After all that prayer, stretched throughout the entirety of the night on the mountainside alone with God and still the unfolding of those prayers could not protect that selection of disciples from having included among the 12 chosen a traitor. Now I'm going to make my confession as to why the question hit me the way that it did. Because I have so often Mount Ararat been confused about the way things unfold after I have spent so much time praying about them. How many of the things I have prayed about did not turn out the way I prayed. I've encouraged people to turn deep issues over to the Lord and then I have been shocked and surprised as to how things have turned out. Jesus spent a whole night in prayer on the mountainside, asking his father for clarity, shaping vision, talking about where to go, what to preach, how much display of power, how long do I stay where, when do I attack the system hard, and when do I retreat? And among all that he prays with regard to who should be chosen to walk with him as disciples, that he will designate apostles. Jesus is led, he is compelled, he concludes that among the 12 there should be Judas, who will become a traitor. How do you pray and that happens? I mean, I thought prayer protects and shields against these kinds of things. I thought prayer reveals the things that look good on the outside but are really harmful under the surface. How could this happen? How could people pray for special relationships and then live convicted that God answered their prayers only to then be caught up in drama they would have never invited into their lives if they knew it would end up like this? 
or to talk to God and to ask God to move in the life of somebody important to you and believe that he did, only to then watch it all go wrong not that long after you have concluded your prayers, or to ask God to be guided and for your steps to be ordered and to believe that God heard those prayers and then end up in context and experiences that are deeply draining and being detoured along paths that in our minds could best be interpreted as a complete waste of my time. How do you pray for right selection in your life and end up with Judas on the team? I wonder if we have perhaps misdefined prayer. Maybe we've misinterpreted its purpose and power for that matter. Our expectations maybe that are attached to prayer Perhaps they're misguided or misaligned. Could it be that prayer is really too fragile and uncertain to be trusted in the fashion that perhaps some of us have trusted it? Is it that it has no significant impact on anything and that prayer is really weightless as a discipline other than to make you feel spiritually connected? Or is prayer to be understood differently than perhaps we have embraced it? Now, make no mistake about it. Prayer is casting our wishes upon God. No doubt about that. Prayer is expressing our vows to him. Prayer is communicating with God to make our hearts and minds like incense to let them burn before the altar of our sovereign God. Prayer is to ask and to muse and to meditate on God, his word, his will, and then to position our lives in his presence. Prayer is to listen and then to receive and to be changed and conformed and transformed by the Lord. All of these make up the prayer lives we are to offer to God. Prayer, as one scholar says, I love it, is the heart finding its home in God. But maybe part of the confusion when Judas ends up in the ranks after an all-night mountainside prayer session is because we mistakenly include in our definition of prayer that prayer is a fail-safe. And to pray is to prevent all threats from my life. We believe, maybe falsely so, that prayer is to make all paths smooth and that prayer guarantees that nothing will hit our lives but success and prosperity and progression and stressless engagement. Secretly, every one of us can be frustrated in and through our prayer lives with God and the fact that we direct our prayers to God because we consider prayer to be a game changer. Prayer should be able to manipulate events and prevent the painful and the disappointing from taking place. Prayer should spot, reveal, and remove Judas before the selection. Why? To prevent betrayal and hurt and pain. But you and I know, don't we? We know that life doesn't unfold like this. So this weekend, we're blessed to sit with Jesus and to enjoy glancing around the teaching possibilities of this focal text because Jesus prayed all night, y'all, and Judas got on the team. Now, of course, Jesus knew that Judas would betray him, but for Christ, who, you will remember, wrestled with the mission of human redemption to the degree that he even himself admitted that this was not easy acceptance for him of this path for human redemption. The cross was not easily palatable. The suffering, the scorn, the shame, the beatings, the bloodshed. He was not walking with easy submission. Jesus was surrendering to the will of his father. The pain, the suffering, the feeling of abandonment, the insults, the beatings, the bloodshed. He confessed, I wanted to pass. He wrestled in his own spirit before submitting to the will of God. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So this early selection, even if with full revelation of Judas's inner contradictions, it doesn't change what I feel led and compelled for us to wrestle with this weekend. And it is this. You don't give up on your prayers because they don't turn out the way you expected. 
If prayer is your heart connecting to home, it is the intimate conversational exchange you have with God, you can't give up on prayer. Why? Because prayer does change things. It does influence mindsets. It does alter outcomes. Prayer does convert and change and release power. Prayer does transform. Prayer does conform. Prayer does stir gifts. You can't give up on prayer then because you submit to it and express your wishes to God by the exercise of its discipline and then it doesn't work out like you thought. You don't weaken your confidence in prayer because along with it comes some issues and battles that you thought your prayers would have eliminated for you. You don't walk away from prayer because after praying you still get attacked or you still got to struggle or you still got to shake hands with trouble. If we follow the image of the text sometimes you can pray and Judas still jumps on your team. And Judas slips up, gets through, and it teaches me a couple of things. One, prayer then is not for guiding outcomes. Prayer is for grounding our lives in the will of God. Let me, let me say it again. Prayer, I could use different terminology, this is probably opens it up a little more. Prayer is not my attempt to manipulate God's decisions. Prayer is to ground me in God's already perfect will. Which means, Errat, as hard as this is to swallow, prayer is not a fail safe. It's a ground. Prayer doesn't prevent the cross, but it sure does give it meaning. Some of y'all gonna catch this. Prayer is the expression of my wishes, the release of my heart expressions to God. Prayer is talking to God, but I'm praying because it's grounding my wishes and my desires in an intended way. Birth, B-E-R-T-H, birth, or space, or emotionality, or thinking consideration. Here's what prayer does. Prayer frames my thoughts and my emotions. It makes me look at things through a spiritual lens. And here's what the text is intending to teach us. Jesus spends all night on the mountainside praying because it grounded his thoughts on the will of his father. Prayer strengthened Jesus to resist the urge to consider the personal over the sacrificial, the ease of path versus the price necessary in order to gift humanity with spiritual redemption. And it's why Jesus doesn't wrestle with his work in ministry in the halls of academia. He doesn't work this out having debates with the philosophers of his time. He doesn't try to get his mind right by talking to physicians and merchants. He's talking to God. He's talking to God in prayer because then his musings and his ideas, his thoughts and considerations, his creative imagination, his wrestlings and decisions, his choices and options are now all grounded spiritually so that if Judas was a surprise, Jesus is now equipped to handle him. And if Judas is revealed early or Jesus knew it from the time of his birth, Jesus can attach the incredulity of his selection to a wider purpose of divine intent. And instead of being frustrated by having to minister around a traitor and dispense message to a traitor and work miracles in front of a traitor...